next minutes. Real quick, I'm gonna go with the calendar. So I did fix it a little bit because we did not get to 3.3 last week, right? Um, we did finish the SG and we started 3.4, but we did not finish 3.4. So we're gonna continue 3.4 today. And I was hoping to get 4.1 and 4.2 done today, but as I'm looking at the packet, unless it's like 3.3 or whatever, just a bunch of pages of content, I need to throw up a problem. Um, then, you know, maybe there's not so much pages of content, but from what I'm looking like, it looks like it might have to actually have top on Okay. Um, we'll just see how it goes today, but I'm thinking we will have to have top on it. it may not be a full period because I may just need to cover the last part of 4.2 or even all of 4.2. It's not very long. Okay. Um, so we'll be able to maybe use the second half of that class period to do homework, but we probably will need to meet tomorrow. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and start on this section. So we did stop in 3.4, and I just kind of wanted to go over like the process or the steps for those rational zeros. So the first uh, cross, the first thing to do is to list all the possible rational zeros, and you do that by taking the leading, actually factors of the leading coefficient over factors of the constant, right? That is what we learned in the last class, okay? Once you have that list of possible rational zeros, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna plug all of those numbers in that list into the function, okay? The ones that give you zero for that value when you plug it in, those are the ones that are actual zeros, okay? And I hate that word, but they're actual x-intercepts, right? Um, and then x minus those values, whatever the ones were that were, those guys are going to be the factors, okay? And then after you have a few of them, as many as you can find throughout that list, then you'll go ahead and go through the process of maybe doing the synthetic division to figure out what you have left, and then possibly having to do the quadratic formula after that, okay? So that's kind of the process that we're going to be doing here. Now, this talks about some stuff really all the stuff that we're about to talk about kind of happens when you're doing this last step. And if you're using that quadratic formula the way we've been doing it to find the solutions, um, if you're doing that quadratic formula, you'll automatically get the imaginaries when you do that process, right? So the imaginaries are not gonna pop up out of nowhere. But we do want you to be aware that the conjugates, that the complex zeros come in pairs. Okay, and that's important because if I tell you for some reason that 3 plus 2i is a 0, and I tell you that, then you would have to know that they come in pairs and that 3 minus 2i is automatically another 0, okay? So that's why it's important to know that they do come in pairs, and they always come in conjugate pairs. What if I tell you that 5i is a 0, then would what other complex number is going to be a zero? The negative five i. Good. Okay. They always have to come in those pairs. Okay. Um, now it says here, for instance, the result applies to this function here, but not to the given function here. So notice that this one is a square. And so if I were to do the conjugate, uh, if I were to do the quadratic formula, I would figure out that the two solutions for this were going to be i and negative i. But this one, would I have to do the quadratic formula? It's already there, isn't it? And there's nothing to do. It's already like in its factor form. All I could do is put a bubble around it. And I don't have another pair. Notice that this is not a polynomial either, is it? Right? It's a, uh, a linear problem with an imaginary number. Okay? Notice that it says that this pairs property only happens when you have real coefficients. So in order for me to have all real coefficients, I have to have the two pairs. Because we already know when you multiply the two pairs together, all the i's just disappear, okay? For instance, if I were to multiply this, if I were to multiply that out, you would realize that all of the i's are just gonna kind of knock out. So let's try it, right? X times X, X times this, x times this, 
then negative three, distribute that guy, get positive nine, I get negative six i. Now distribute the negative two i. So I get negative two i x, then I get positive six i, and then here and here I get a negative four i squared, don't I? And if I combine all these like terms, those i's are gonna wait, go away, these i's are gonna go away. I'm gonna get x squared minus three x minus three x plus nine. And what is i squared? It's just a negative one. So that i went away as well, right? And I just have six x, that would be plus four and 13. And notice I have only real coefficients there, right? And that's because the zeros came in those conjugate pairs, okay? If they don't come in conjugate pairs, then you're left with coefficients that have i's in them, right? Isn't this constant an i, right? And that's why I only have one imaginary, okay? So this conjugate pair stuff happens only when your when your function has to have real coefficients. So here's an example. It says find a fourth degree polynomial. That means I have to have four. I call them bubbles, but I have to have four factors, right? Four things in parentheses. So as soon as you see this fourth degree, your brain should already imagine I'm going to have four factors. That make sense? Okay. And then it tells me what some of them are. It tells me that I have one that is a negative one. If I have negative one as a quote unquote zero, then what goes inside the parentheses? If this guy is a zero, what is in the parentheses? It's always X minus that number, right? So remember that property because it's gonna happen on the test too. If your zeros are this number, your factors are this, right? And it could be called zeros, it could be called x-intercepts, or it could be called solutions. They use those same three words for the number, okay? always. But once you know what that number is, the factor should always be x minus that number. So what do I get when I do x minus a negative one? I'll get x plus one, which is this factor right here, okay? Then I have another one that's the exact same thing, so I would have another factor with the exact same thing, right? But then it tells me that three i is also a factor, so that, or a zero. So then I have three, I have x minus three i as a factor. But we already know from that conjugate pairs, right, that if three i is a zero, then automatically negative three i is going to be another zero which makes sense because now I have the four that I'm supposed to have, right? And so then that one would be X minus a negative three I, which changes it to X plus three I. And once you have your bubbles, you should be able to multiply this out and give them a polynomial. Now, it just says find a polynomial. Normally when it says find, you know, any polynomial, this number right here could be anything. That leading coefficient, it could be anything. Normally we make a equal to one and we just say the function is equal to this. If it tells you to find a uh, function, if it tells you an extra piece of information, like, but it also has to go through this point and it gives you the coordinates for a point that should lie on that function. Then you have to actually plug in the y value of that point here plug in the x value of that point in all four locations of x, and then you'd have to solve for that a in order to tell me what that a is supposed to be, okay? It doesn't happen too often, but I'm not gonna say that it doesn't happen, okay? So we'll see as we go through the section. Some books will give you problems like that, and some of them won't. We just switched to this new book, so I don't know. That's why I'm kind of giving you a heads up, okay? In case you have to do that later. Okay, so, See, so for simplicity, they always let A equal one, okay? And then what they're trying to do is they're trying to um, lessen the amount of steps that they have to do. I have to multiply these all out, but we know with multiplication, it's commutative, right? So I can take any two of these and multiply them together and take any other two of them and multiply them together, okay? They conveniently want to multiply these two together and multiply these two together, okay? You always want to multiply your imaginaries together. 
okay, especially if they're conjugates, because we know what happens when you multiply those, all the i's go away, right? So to make things easier on yourself, multiply the stuff with the i's together first, and then go ahead and multiply these guys. So they did boil this out. You get one x and another one x, so that's where this two x came from, right? This one, there's a lot going on in the middle, but they didn't show it. So I do get x squared plus three i x, and then minus three i x, and then minus nine i squared. We know those are gonna cancel. And then what happens is I squared changes the sign, doesn't it? Right, because it's a negative. So I end up with that plus sign, okay? They just tell you what it is, but it's what it comes out to. So then all they have to do last is just take the two results and multiply them to each other, right? And so they are missing some steps in there, possibly. If I multiply that one, I get x to the four. Here I get nine x squared. Here I get two x cubed. Here I get 18 x. There I get one x squared. And last I get nine. And so if you combine all your like terms, there's only an x to the four. There's only the two x cubed. But I have positive nine x squared and positive one x squared, which is where this 10 x squared came from, right? 18 x is still there and a nine is still there. Okay. So they're just foiling it all out. So we know about this theorem already, okay? Depending on what your degree is, that's gonna tell you how many parentheses you have, okay? And then if you're given information, you can find that A. If you're not given any information, if you're not given a point, then you can't find that A, just let it be one, okay? Um, you could let it be anything and the computer should take it, even if you chose not to let A equal one. If you chose A to be two and you multiply the two in, totally okay, the computer will take it. Um, just as long as the rest of it is correct. So, dun, dun, dun. I don't need to read all of that. Here we go. Um, a quadratic factor with no real zeros is said to be prime or irreducible over the reals. Notice that they're saying that it's irreducible over the reals. So this guy, we cannot factor with real numbers, right? We can factor this with real numbers, but we cannot factor this guy with real numbers. And in the past, we would always just say, well, if it's a sum of two squares, it's just prime, right? And that's exactly what this is saying. Before, when you had a sum of two squares, you would just say it was prime. And that was it. But if you consider the imaginary, then you can factor it with imaginaries. Okay. And I think I mentioned that the last class, right? You would factor it just like you would, just like you would the regular one, because this is a one, right? So you have one minus x minus one and x plus one. But to get that plus sign in there, you're gonna have to put some i's on it. And so then that's actually just x minus i and then x plus i, right? Even if the number is not a perfect square, you can still factor it. The regular, the difference of squares, you can still factor it. All you have to do is take the square root of that. That's essentially what you're doing when you factor this. When you factor that and you try to figure out what goes in the parentheses, you know x times x is x squared, right? But then you think to yourself, what times what equals nine, right? You're actually taking the square root of nine. What is the square root of nine? Three. And we know that three times three gives us that nine, right? So if you have a number that isn't a perfect square, it's okay. When you take the square root of it, it just looks like the square root of five. And then one with the minus and one with the plus, right? Even if I put a plus sign in the middle of it, you would do the same thing. You would put x and x, the square root of five, the square root of five, a minus and a plus, but because it's a plus sign, I have to put the i there, right? And you can choose to put them in front of the radical or behind the radical. If you put them behind the radical, make sure that the house does not go over that i, right? Okay. So it's just letting you know you can factor it. I typically don't factor them, I just use the quadratic formula and I'll get the i that way, okay? But they apparently want to point out to you that you could. 
it might come in handy. It might save you a few seconds in calculus, right? But not too much of a big deal. Okay, so what is this example? It says, find all the zeros of this polynomial, given that this is a zero of f. Okay, so we already know that if this is a zero of f, what is automatically another zero of f? One minus three f. Good. And so then, I do not like what they did. I'm going to show you something else. I do not like how they did this. I like synthetic division, okay? And so I'm not gonna do this problem the way they do it. What they did is they did X minus that first factor and then X minus the second factor. They went ahead and distributed the minus or they didn't actually. They did X times X, the heck did they do? I don't know what they did. They like try to regroup it and do some weird, weird clever stuff. But this is what I would do. When you have a zero, Right? Let me give you the zero just like this. This is the number. You can put everybody in the synthetic division. I have 1x to the 4, negative 3x cubed, positive 6x squared, positive 2, and negative 60. Is that right? Was anybody missing? Everybody's there, right? And then I'm going to put this 1 plus 3i out here because it's my zero, right? I'm gonna bring down the first guy. I get one. One times anything is that same thing, right? Remember how to combine reals and imaginary. You can only combine the real pieces together. So I end up with negative two plus three i here, don't I? Okay. Then I have to take this and multiply it by that. Now that's gonna be a little bit extra, so I'm gonna go over the side to do it. I wonder if the calculator does it. I don't think it does. I think the other calculator is the one with the little I in it. No, it doesn't. There's another calculator. It's it's not this one. It's a different one, but it has like an I somewhere around here. And it does do it, but here it doesn't. Okay, negative two, three I minus six I plus nine i squared. So this becomes negative three i. And what is this number really? Negative nine. So I have negative two and negative nine, which gives me negative 11, right? So I'm gonna have negative 11 minus three i here. Again, I can only combine the reals. This is the one that sucks. When I do the second one, it's not so bad. <laughs> this one is not great though. So I get negative five and I have this minus three I here. And so I gotta do the same thing again, right? One plus three I and negative five plus three I. So distribute positive three I, negative 15 I and positive nine I squared. This is gonna turn into a negative nine minus five is negative 14. And these two together give me negative 12 I. I'm supposed to get zero, right, at the end, because it's a quote unquote zero. Did I make an error? If I did, let me know. This one here, it should be negative three i. Three i and negative six i should be negative three i. So when I combine those, I still have minus three i. Oh, get it here. <laughs> Thank you. That should be a minus 3i. So let's see, negative 5, negative 3i, negative 15, and negative 9. So that i squared is going to change this to plus then, right? So plus 9 and negative 5 actually give me positive 4. Good catch, good catch. And then negative 3 and negative 15 give me negative 18. So that will change this completely, won't it? Okay, I can combine my real stuff. So I get six minus 18i, and then I gotta multiply this is the last time I gotta do this. So we get six 
we get negative 18i, we get positive 18i, and then we get positive 24i squared. So these two will go away. And what do I get when we do 6 minus 24? I cannot get negative 16. Something's happening here. Did something wrong. And down the 1, 1, negative 2, plus 3i. You can catch it, let me know. That's negative three i, that's negative nine. Plus three i, negative five. Plus three i, negative one. Here, three times b, I think it's 24. But thinking that these numbers are not correct. Oh, no, I think it's 18 or 18. Ah, thank you. You are right. This is 18. Perfect. You are right. Isn't it supposed to be a minus 18, not a plus 18? That's the problem. I read my own right. It's supposed to be this, right? Okay, so six and then minus 18i and then plus 18i and then yes, that will change that number there. We go. I was thinking it was really far back. Three times 18, perfect, thank you. So I get 54i squared. And it actually should be a negative 54i squared. So then what does that happen? This I squared is going to turn that into positive 54. And then now I get that 60 that we knew we were supposed to get. Because we knew we were supposed to get a remainder of zero, right? It told us it was a zero. Okay. Now, I don't like to rewrite the whole thing. I just like to continue where I left off. Okay. If this one's in zero, then so is this one. Right? And we're going to do the same thing over again, but this time it's not going to be so bad. So I'm going to get one. And then this times one is just one minus three i. So look, the i's go away, and I just get negative one, don't I? And then this guy times negative one just means the signs change. So I get negative one plus three i. Notice that the i's go away, and I get negative six. Right? Then I multiply negative six times both of these. I get negative six and positive 18i, and I get that zero that we know we're supposed to get, right? But I have three numbers left, don't I? That means this is my A, my B, and my C, and the quadratic part of that, okay? So then I'm gonna go negative B, plus or minus B squared, minus four times A times C, all over to times k. So I get 25 over 2. I get 5 over 2. So that's 6 over 2, which is 3. Negative 4 over 2, which is negative. Okay. So now I have all the bubbles. I have uh, x minus 1 plus 3i. I have x minus 1 minus 3i, and I have x minus 3 and x plus 2, right? Those are all four of the bubbles, okay? Now, I do, if they want the polynomial, I do have to multiply this all out, don't I? Okay? And this is where they start getting a little tricky with the way they multiply it out. So, they went ahead and did long division. I do not like long division, which is why I prefer to do this way. Okay, so you can go over it because you should have this packet. Um, if you have this packet, you can go over that. I am not going to though, just because I do not like long division. So I'm going to distribute this negative, and I'm going to distribute the negative down here too. So I get x minus 1 minus 3i, x minus 1 plus 3i, my x minus 3, and my x plus 2. Is that the same? I had on the previous page. And then we're just going to foil these out. So I'm going to foil these two and foil those two. 
So for this one, and then boil the water. Red minus a three I, and then that minus positive three I, and put those two together give me minus nine I squared. That's what I have in this first bubble. So I get x squared, those wipe out, those wipe out, minus 2x. And then what constant do I get? Only 2x. Uh -huh, this will turn that to a plus, right? So I have 1, 1 plus 9, which is 10, which is exactly what they have. And then here, if I boil these out, I get 2x minus 3x minus 6. And so I get x squared minus x minus 6. Isn't that exactly what they have? Okay. And then if they wanted me to continue going, I would, but I don't think that was the directions. What was the directions on this problem? It was find all the zeros, period. So I didn't even need to do all that. We already knew all the zeros. You were given this one. We found this one because you know about conjugate pairs, right? And through the quadratic formula, we found this one and this one. Okay. So in web assign, if it tells you to find all of the zeros, you're going to need to enter all four. If it tells you to find all remaining zeros, then you only want the ones that I've circled, okay? Not the original ones that they gave you. So pay attention to whether it says they want all the zeros or all remaining zeros, okay? Because you'll have them right, but you're just putting this one in there when you should. Does that make sense? Okay, so just be careful with those directions. Now, had it asked me for the polynomial, then I should have been doing this, and I would have had to have kept going and multiply that all out. But I already know what that's going to come out to all multiplied out because they gave me the function, didn't they? Okay, so I was just going. <laughs> I was already done with the problem. Okay. So there are a couple of other tests that you can do with um, polynomials. They have the Descartes rule of signs. I'll be honest with you, I learned it in college algebra, um, but I have never used it, like ever, ever. I'll show it to you, but there's probably not going to be anything on the review or the test or anything like that, just because this is one of those things that, yeah, that's cool, but <laughs> I'm not going to really use it all, all too much. Okay, so what you do is you take the polynomial and you basically scan it for changes in signs. Okay, and so you'll look at all the coefficients and you'll see how many times that it changes signs, and then it'll tell you how many positive real zeros you have and how many negative real zeros you have, depending on what you do. So I'm trying to find a problem where it will have it for that. So for this one. It has x cubed minus 3x plus 2. Okay, so what you do is you look at the original function and you count the number of changes. Didn't it change sign from here to here? And then didn't it change sign again from there to there? So I have two changes, which means I could have two positive zeros. And they have to be positive real zeros. This method does not work with imaginaries, okay? Now, we also know that conjugates come in pairs, right? So what if these aren't true real numbers? What if they're two imaginaries? That means I can have two or zero positive real zeros, okay? Then you do the same thing, but now you have to plug in the negative x. And I'll explain to you the fast way to do this, but I'm going to do it the long way the first time. Okay, so when you cube a negative, what do you end up with, a positive or a negative? A negative. And then a negative times a negative is going to be a positive 3x, and then the plus 2 is just going to come back. Okay, essentially when you're doing this part, the f of negative x, the constants are going to stay the same because you don't have no x to plug it into, right? The constants are just going to come down. But any fact, anything that has an odd exponent is going to completely change sign. 
And anything that has an even exponent, like an x to the fourth or an x squared, they're still going to stay the same sign. Okay. So if I'm looking at my original function, this has an odd exponent. So I know that that's going to go from positive to negative. This guy has a little imaginary one exponent, doesn't it? But it's odd. So I know that this term is going to change sign. And your constants are never going to change sign. They just come down. Okay. Then once you have that, you're going to count your sign variations again. Do I change sign from here to here? Yes. Do I change sign here? No. So I only have one negative real zero. And I don't have enough for a pair of conjugates to exist in there, do I? It's just one. I need two or more in order for a pair of conjugates to exist in here. So then basically what they tell me is that I either have two positive or no positive real zeros, which is exactly what we said up there. And then eventually I have one negative real zero. Now look at the zeros of this. What is the zero from this factor? One, right? What is the zero from this factor? Another one. What is the zero from this factor? Negative two. Don't I have two positives and one negative? Right? So that's what's cool about the Descartes. It kind of gives you a hint as to what it's going to come out to. The only time that that will ever even be handy for us is if we are listing all the possible rationals. Can you remember how we have to plug them all in to see if we get zero? If you find out, like, if you were to do the Descartes and realize, oh, I'm only going to have one negative, and you find the negative number that work, you don't have to try any of the other negatives because you know they're not all going to work. You know, it's from the one, right? I don't. I just plug in my calculator and just go for it, okay? But it, it could possibly come in handy. So for this polynomial, how many sign changes do I have in the original function? Do I have one here? Do I have a change here? Do I have a change here? Yes. So that's how many changes? Three. So I have three, or if I take out a pair of conjugates, how many do I have? Just one. So I have three or one positive real zeros. Now we're going to do the f of negative x. And for that one, we're only changing the signs of the guys with the odd exponents. Okay. So this has an odd exponent, which means it'll change to negative 3x cubed. This has an even exponent, so it stays exactly the same. This guy has an odd exponent, so it changes to negative. And the constant always stays the same, right? You can't plug in a negative x to a constant. Are there any sign changes? No. So I will have zero negative real zeros. So if I was doing that list of possible zeros, I wouldn't even be trying any of the negatives, right? I would only be focused on the positives in that list because I already know none of the reals, none of the negatives are going to work. See what I mean? How it can come in handy, but I don't really use it. Um, that's just verifying everything. Okay, and this is something I never did, like ever, ever. It's upper and lower bound stuff. I think I want to cover it. Let me go check in your homework and make sure there's no lower bound, upper bound stuff. Because otherwise I'm wasting my breath. I've never used it ever. My teacher showed it to me, but <laughs> I never used it. So I don't think there is anything that comes down, so we'll double check. Nothing to do with bounds, so I'm not going to talk about bounds, but especially since we're prime for time. So don't worry about this lower upper bound stuff. Again, more lower and upper bound stuff. So we finally got into the applications of it. So let's see what they're going to do as far as application. So it says, here's an additional hint that can help you find the real zeros of a polynomial. When you have the function, um, 
and you have a common monomial factor, it should be factored out before applying the test to this section. So if you're going to do that, um, that list, the possible list of zeros, remember you're supposed to take the factors of the leading coefficient over the factors of the constant. Do I even have a constant here? Don't. So you would have to factor out that common x before you could even continue with the rest of the problem. Okay. Because then now I can apply the rest of that part of that list to this, right? And I do have a constant inside that parentheses. Okay, so it's all that's letting you know is if you do have, you know, X on everybody, factor it out. And then once you have that constant, you can do the list of possible zeros. Um, you are designing, oh, this is the actual example. It says you are designing candle making kits. Each kit contains 25 cubic inches of candle wax and a mold for making a pyramid shaped candle. You want the height of the candle to be two inches less than the length of each side of the candle's square base. So apparently the candle has a square base and then it's going up like this, right? So it's kind of like a rectangular prism. And the height is supposed to be two inches less than the width. So obviously it's a long candle then. And the height is gonna be shorter than this length here. So kind of like one of those candles. What should the dimensions of your candle mold be? It says the volume, here we go. The volume of this pyramid, this thing here, actually it's a pyramid. Oh shoot, it's not a rectangle, it's a pyramid. So it's a short pyramid thing. Does it say I have a square base square, right? I am horrible at drawing 3D. I cannot do this. This is like the worst. I'm going to say that's my height. And then I'm going to try to connect this to all sorts, whatever. So <laughs> I try to draw. I cannot draw at all. And it's horrible because I'm a visual person. But if this were drawn right, I have my square base, and then this right here is the height. It's from the center of the square all the way to the peak of that pyramid. Does that make sense? Okay. And it's saying that this height here has to be two inches less than the length. Okay, so there's the length of the sides. My height has to be that length minus two. Okay. Um, and then it says for the volume of a pyramid, so if I knew my geometrical formulas, I should know this one. If for some reason you're going to need to use a geometrical formula on the test, I will give you the formula for all the geometric figures, like the circle, the sphere, all that, right? Okay, it says B is the area of the base, and we know that that's a square, right? Um, now it looks like they're saying H is the height, and it's letting X equal the length. So they're basically labeling this guy the X. So then that means my height can be written as X minus two. Right? And so if I plug everybody in, how do you find the area of this base? It's a square. So wouldn't it just be x times x? Right? And so that's where they're getting that x squared from. So if I plug everybody in, we have one third, which is the same as this one third. And then they have the area of the base, which is x squared. And then they have the height, which is this expression, x minus 2. Okay. And so they're saying that it, since it has a volume of 25 cubic inches, we know that this volume thing here is the 25 <coughs> cubic inches. Okay. And then we're just solving for x. So they went ahead and multiplied both sides by 3 to get rid of this fraction. And so now you have 75 equal to this. And it looks like they went ahead and distributed the x squared. And that's where these two terms came from. And from there, you do have a cubic, so I do need to move the 75 over. And now I have to solve this, and this cannot be factored, right? Not with our traditional old school methods. It can't because of the cube. So we have to go figure out, well, how are we going to put that in its factors, right? All the little factors. So what they did was they list the possible zeros. What was my function? X cubed minus 2x squared, or x and squared, minus 75. 
So this is what I had, right? So if you take the factors of the constant, I think I wrote that down wrong for you. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be your factors of the constant over the factors of the leading coefficient. There we go. So when I try to list mine, I'm going to have to do the factors of 75 over the factors of what? Leading coefficient is what number here? One. It's this guy, right? He's the guy with the highest exponent, so I need his coefficient, okay? Which is one. So I'm finding the factors of 75 and the factors of one. Factors of one are easy, it's just one, right? The factors of 75 are not as easy. Square root of 75 is 8 point something. This is the only way you will know you have all the factors. Because the last thing you want to do is not have all the factors. And then you do all the work and you find out that nothing's working, right? And it's probably the mystery factors that you forgot, okay? So make sure that you do have all of these. And I know I have to go all the way down to whatever the square root of this number is without the decimals. So when I took the square root of 75, I got this weird thing. I did the double arrow so I could get the decimal. Notice that the decimal, the number in front of the decimal is eight, right? So that's why on my list, I went all the way down to eight only, okay? That's how I know I have all of them is if I go all the way down to that square root number. Okay. And so then it's a matter of what is 75 divided by one? It's just 75, right? 75 divided by two, it's a decimal, so it doesn't work. 75 divided by three is 25. 75 divided by four is a decimal. 75 divided by five is 15. 75 divided by six, is a decimal, 75 divided by seven, another decimal, and 75 divided by eight is another decimal. So I know for a fact that those are all of them, okay? I noticed that they just went down the list here and then up the other side. So one, then three, then five, then 15, then 25, and then 75, right? It got them all. And it could be any sign variations of those. So that's why you see the plus or minus is in front of everything. How do we know which one works? We're going to have to plug them in, okay? So we're going to have to figure out what f of one is, what f of negative one is, what f of three is, f of negative three, so on and so forth until we get at least one that works. Now, I'm telling you until you get at least one. Why just one and not until I get all three, okay? You only need one for this particular problem because you have a cube. And if I take one of those factors out, what kind of function am I going to have left? Is that going to be squared, right? And I can do quadratic formulas when I have squared functions, quadratics, right? If this were an x to the fourth problem, you would have to find two of them before you get down to a quadratic. So however many the highest exponent is, you want that exponent to get down to a quadratic, okay? So since this is just a cube, I only need to find one that works, and then I can go, okay? But I just want you to be aware, because if it is an x to the fourth problem, I would have to have two that work before I could get to a quadratic, okay? So let's see. I'm going to program a calculator. Actually, let me store one, store x first, and then we're going to do x to the third minus two x squared minus 75. So I plugged in one and I got negative 76. Now I'm gonna plug in negative one and I get negative 78. I'm gonna plug in three 
I'm getting negative 66, negative three. I know it tells me which one works, but I want to show the whole process, right? And I finally get zero, right? You have to get the zero in order for this guy to say, yes, that's one, okay? If this were next to the fourth, I would have to keep going until I get a second zero, okay? Once you have that second zero, you can stop. You don't have to do all of them all with 75. So we do this synthetic division. I take this function here. I have one for x cubed. I have negative two for x squared, but I don't have any x's, right? So that's why there's a zero in there for the missing x's in between here, okay? And then you have your constant negative 75. Now we go through that process of the synthetic division. So five times one is five. Combine those, we get three. Multiply, we get 15. Combine 15, multiply 75, combine, we get zero. If this were an x to the fourth and you had two, right? You have to get two. You would just continue from here and then keep going until you've got three numbers, okay? Because if it were an x to the fourth, you'd have a whole, you'd have another, another column, right? And so you'd end up with four numbers down here and you have to keep going until you only have three. For quadratic formula, I only need three, right? A, B, and C. So you keep going until you get three. Now that I have three, I can do my A, B, and C. Okay. So I know that five is one of the zeros. And if I want to find the other two, then I'm going to go do my quadratic formula. So I get negative B plus or minus B squared minus four times A times C all over to A. I get what is four times 15? 60. So I get nine minus 60. This gives me a negative 51. What kind of answers do you get when you have a negative inside here? Imaginary. I'm doing an application problem, aren't I? Does it make sense for the links to be imaginary? No, right? So these are bad, so we should pull them in. Okay. I'm going to say the link of the pyramid face and not the imaginary. And that's why we're out going, right? So then this five is my go. That's my answer. Okay. So then now I know that the candle, the base should be five, right? Five inches by five inches. But in order for me to find the height, I have to do that X value minus two. So five minus two, which is where they got the three inches from. Okay. Like that. So they just did X minus two, which is five minus two. to get that height. Okay. Let's see. Determine the number of zeros of the polynomial. How many zeros will this polynomial have? This is like a summary. Look we'll at this section now. This is going way back to the beginning of the section which we talked about yesterday. What are you supposed to look at to decide how many zeros they have? Yes, it is seven. Look at the highest exponent. What is the highest exponent here? Seven. Mm -hmm. It didn't say how many real, right? It just said how many zeros. So I don't know if there's some of them are imaginary or not. I don't care. All of them, there's seven zeros. Some of them might be the same, right? Like x minus one, x minus one, right? That doesn't matter. It's just there's seven of them. Okay. Here, this one says, use the rational zeros test to list all the possible. So you're going to have a fraction. It's the factors of who over who. What number goes on top? 16, good. A constant goes on top. And then what number goes on the bottom? Right, the big guy, the guy with the highest exponent, his coefficient. So then we get 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16 and one. If you have to do this thing, what's the square root of 16? 
four. So I only go down the list to four. And then 16 divided by one is 16, 16 divided by two is eight, 16 divided by three is a decimal, and 16 divided by four is four. Notice that four does not need to be on the list twice. Okay, it just needs to be one, it is a factor. And then you just put the plus or minuses. Since I only have one number here, they just basically all go over one. I wanna actually show you something before we move on to the next problem. Because what if it's not just one? All the problems we've been doing is just a one down here, right? We have not shown you an example of what happens when we have more than one number down here. So for instance, let's say I have four X to the third minus seven X squared plus three X minus 12. Okay. If I were doing this problem, I would have to do the factors of 12 over the factors of what? The four. And so then the factors of 12, what's the square root of 12? It's small, so 3.4. Yeah, 3.4. So I got the factors of 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. And what about 4? The, fact, the square root of four is just two, right? So we have one, four, and two, and two. So when I come here, what are the numbers? Great, right. you don't need to do the two twice, right? But here's where it gets interesting. I have to put all of these numbers over one, okay? So of course I'm gonna get one, two, three, four, six, and 12, right? But then I've got to put all these numbers over two. So when I put one over two, I get a half. When I put two over two, I get one and it's already on the list, right? When I put three over two, I get three halves. When I put four over two, I get two, it's already there. Six over two is three and 12 over two is six, right? So I don't have any extra. Now I've got to put everybody over four. So one over four is one fourth. Two over four reduces to one half. Three over four is a new one. Four over four is one. Six over four reduces to three halves. And 12 over four reduces to three, okay? So these are all of the possible combinations. So I just wanted to make you aware of what happens if you do have more than one guy at the bottom, okay? Just don't repeat anybody that reduces to someone that's already there, okay? Okay, these are the big ones. This next problem is like a one. <laughs> so this one just says find, if possible, the rational zeros of the function. So they didn't give you any hints whatsoever. They just said find them. We have a default. If they give us no information, we can use this whole process to figure it out, okay? So I would be taking the factors of who over who. Mm -hmm. Over one. So we got lucky here. Um, 30, square root of 30 is five point something. So I'm just gonna go to five. And so then this is 30, this is 15, this is 10. I think that's a decimal, but let me make sure. Yeah, the decimal. And then five times six, right? So my numbers are one, two, three, five, six, 10, 15, and 30. And they would all be over one. So it's literally these numbers, but with pluses and minuses. I'm not gonna rewrite them there, <laughs> okay? If the computer tells me to list them, then I have to write them, right? But for me, that's good enough. I just know all of them are gonna have a big fat plus or minus in front of all of them, okay? How many do I need to find before I can use the quadratic formula? How many of these do I need to make sure work before I find, before I can use the quadratic formula? Just one, because it's a cube, right? 
So to make a square, we need to take out one. Okay. So we will start plugging in one and negative one and three and negative three and going down the process. But as soon as one of them gives us that zero, we can stop with this mess. Okay. And just go do the synthetic division. So let me see. One stores x, and then I'm going to write this function down. So x to the third minus 31x plus 30. Oh, look, I got lucky. <laughs> it was the first one. <laughs> that is super lucky. I've done problems where like the last one was the one that worked. It's stupid. And all the rest were imaginary, so I had to put it in the division. Okay, so we found one that works. So this is the guy we're going to use in the synthetic division, the number that worked. Okay. Now, help me out with my coefficients inside here. What is the first coefficient that goes on the inside? One. What is the next coefficient? Correct, because there's no squares, right? There's no x squared, so you have to fill in that spot. Then the negative 31x, and then the constant, positive 30. Don't forget about those missing facts. Okay, you will get the wrong answers if you forget the missing facts. So one times one is one. Zero and one is one. One times one is one. Negative 31 and one is negative 30. One times negative 30 is negative 30. And we knew that was supposed to work out, right? We did get zero. So now we have our A, B, and our C, or our quadratic formula to get the last two. That's all I want you to do is find the zeros. So I already know when I give them the answer, what's the first one I found? One. And now I just need to find the other two, right? So let's see. X equals negative B plus or minus B squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. I get negative one plus or minus the square root of 121 over two, which is 11. So I get negative one plus 11, which is 10, over two gives me five. Negative one minus 11 is negative 12, over two gives me negative six. So then now I have the last two guys, and we are done, okay? So this is more like what you're gonna see in the homework, right? You may get some problems that just ask you for the list, and you probably will get maybe one or two that'll just ask you how many zeros does it have. Okay. okay, we got one, two more actually. No, three more. So these are all going to be like the ones in the homework. So this one says find a polynomial function with real coefficients that have the given zeros. So these are my zeros. If this one is a zero, I automatically know I have another one. What is it? Positive two i. And so then my function will be, remember we told you it could have any coefficient, but if they didn't give me any information about it, just pick one, right? Like an invisible one. And then what's gonna go in this first factor for that guy? For this one, it will be x minus two, always the opposite, right? Because when I set this equal to zero, I gotta get that positive two, right? So it's always gonna be the opposite signs in here. So when that one goes inside, it's gonna turn to a positive two i, right? And then when this one goes inside, it's gonna turn to minus two i. Okay. Always multiply your i factors first. This guy's left by himself, so we're just gonna leave him there for now but we definitely want to multiply these guys. So x squared minus 2ix and then positive 2ix and then minus 4i squared. So these will wipe each other out and this becomes x squared and what? Right, that i squared is going to change that sign, right? So it's going to be plus 4. And then I just need to multiply these guys out. So foil again.
So you could type it in there like that, but just to be more formal, I'm going to put it in descending order, which means my square is go after the hues, right? The same thing. It's just in the current order. But I believe web assigned can take this. As long as it's all multiplied out, it should take that. But to be formal, it should be written like this. Okay. Next problem again is another one like the ones in homework. So this one says. This one does give me extra information. So if I told you if it gave you that point, you have to find that A. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> just hadn't done it yet. Okay. So it says find a polynomial function with real coefficients um, that has the given degree, the given zeros, and this solution point. Okay. So I have degree four, which means my function, although I don't know what the leading coefficient is, should have four bubbles, right? Because it's degree four. So then this zero, so when it comes inside, it's going to be x plus two. When the middle zero goes inside, it's going to be x minus one. When this zero, the last one, goes in here, it becomes x minus i. But if i is a zero, what is the last zero? It should be a negative i up here, and so then an x plus i down here. It has to be the conjugate, right? Now, here I do have two others to multiply. So let me just figure this out first, and then we'll go from there. So I can multiply those two together, and then multiply these two together. Okay. So let's see x squared minus x plus 2x minus 2. Over here, we have x squared plus xi minus xi minus i squared. So I have x squared plus x minus 2, and x squared, that's actually going to turn negative, and a negative is in plus 1, right? And then we can keep going if we want. So we get x to the fourth. There's my degree four plus x squared plus x cubed plus x minus two x squared minus two. And I'm going to combine my like terms. These two together are actually going to make negative x squared. And that's all I can do so far, right? So I've done everything just like the last problem. The only thing different from the last problem with this one is that I've kept that A there, right? Instead of making it go away. Because I actually need to figure out what that is. And so I'm going to use this information. Remember, what's inside the parentheses is your X value. And F of that X value is your Y value. Okay? So that means this guy and C notation for y is going to become a negative 6. And all of the x's are going to become zeros. And I'm plugging it in for purposes for later, right? But if I plug in zeros there, I just get a bunch of zeros, don't I? And what's a bunch of zeros minus 2? It's just negative 2, right? And how do I solve for a there then? Divide by negative, excess multiplied, right? So you do the opposite, which is divide, and you get that 3 equals a. So then I know that my function is going to have a 3 in the front of all of that mess. And you can't type it in here like that. You have to actually distribute that 3. So you get 3x to the 4, 3x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x and then minus and this is what they want in the computer okay 
So if they do not give you that point, if they do not give you this, you do not have to worry about this little game. Once you're here, you're done, right? But if they do give you that point, keep the A in there and then plug in the Y value on the X value. Okay, we have one more. So this one says, use the given zero to find all the zeros. This is that nightmare problem that I was doing and I was getting all the like for the 8 and 18. <laughs> That's this one, okay. So we're gonna try it again. Hopefully you don't make so many mistakes like that again, okay? So I won't go too fast if it's messed up. So I'm gonna put my zero on the outside here. I'm gonna leave myself some room because I do know that I'm gonna have like two turns, right? All the way. So cube is the highest. I have one x cubed. I have 11 x squared. I have 65 x's and then my constant. I didn't have anybody missing. So we're good there. I'm going to bring this guy down. One times that is the exact same thing. So 11 minus 4 is actually 7 minus 5 x. And I'm going to come over here at the top and I'm going to multiply these out. So this thing times this thing. So I get negative 28, positive 20i, negative 35i, and then positive 25i squared. So this is actually negative 15i, and that will be negative 25, won't it? So I really have negative 28 minus 25. Negative 15. So negative 53 minus 15i, 65 minus 53, I get 12 minus 15i. Negative 4 minus 5i times 12 minus 15i. Negative 48, positive 16, negative 15, I think that's 60, but let me make sure. Yep. And then positive 5 times 15, 75i squared. So these wipe out, and that's actually negative 48 minus 75. And I get negative 120. That's what I'm supposed to get, right? I'm supposed to get that zero there. Okay. So we already know that if this is a zero, what's the next zero? If this imaginary is zero, what is the other one? It's going to be negative 4 plus 5i. The only thing that changes sign is the middle. Okay? Don't change the 4. This one is a whole bunch easier. So this times this is negative 4 plus 5i. So those wipe out, I just get 3. 3 times both of these is going to give me negative 12 and positive 15i, which wipes out both of those, giving me zero, right? So it says, use the given zero to find all the zeros of the function. So we know this is one. We know this is another one. Can you tell me what the last one is? What does this turn out to look like? Isn't this the constant three, and it's positive, right? And then one x. Right? So if this is a factor, what is the zero? Negative three, which means that my last zero is negative three. And these are all the zeros. Notice it said all the zeros, not remaining. Right? It said find all the remaining zeros. These are my only two answers. Okay, we finally finished. So we are definitely going to be in class tomorrow because we're going to get into 4.1, but we are not going to be able to finish all the way to 4.2. So in 4.1, I'm going to go in there. We're going to first talk about the domains of rational functions, but we've already talked about that. So it's not anything new. I'm just going to talk, you know, say it again, repeat it, just jog back your memory. Then we're going to talk about something that are called vertical and horizontal asymptotes. 
And then we're gonna eventually, I don't even think we have this in this section, but it says use rational functions to model and solve real life problems. I don't know that we do that in this section. We'll talk about it. Okay. So a rational function is when you have polynomials in numerator and or the denominator. Importantly, you have to have x in the denominator in order to be considered a rational function. Okay. So this is not a rational function. But this is a rational function. Okay. Because that can be written as one half x plus one plus one half actually. So that's not, that's just a line, right? Not a rational function. However, this, there's no way you can rewrite it. There's still going to be an x downstairs. Okay. So be careful. It has to have x in the denominator. And what do we know about the domain of the fraction when you have x in the denominator? Denominators cannot equal zero. And what's interesting is we tell you that, right? We tell you that the denominator cannot be zero. But if you look at the graph, I know it can't be zero. But what the heck is happening around zero, okay? Why can't it be zero? What is happening in the graph that is telling you you can't have zero in the denominator, okay? What happens in the graph is this. So notice how this part of the graph is going up and then this part of the graph is going down. And neither one of those pieces of the graph are ever gonna touch that y-axis, okay? Which is why you say the x cannot equal zero. It can't. It's never going to have a y value up there, and it's never going to have a y value down here when x is zero. Okay. This imaginary line that's right there, it just so happens that it's on top of the y axis right now. But this imaginary line that this side never touches and that side never touches is called an asymptote. Okay. And if you notice, you also have a horizontal one. This one is vertical, right? You also have a horizontal one, and it's right here. Because this part of the graph will never touch the x-axis, and this part of the graph will never touch the x-axis. It will get super close, and I mean super close. Like, to your eyes, it might look like it's touching it, but if you zoom in, it's not, okay? It's just getting really, 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 really close. But when you start getting to point 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, do our eyes really see that difference? No, right? So it gets super close. It just never touches it, okay? Those are called asymptotes. This one's being vertical asymptotes, that one being horizontal asymptotes. Now they tell you, this is how they word it, okay? It says that the Y value is going to negative infinity as X goes to zero from the left. You see that little tiny thing there? It's like a little minus sign up at the top. It's not an exponent, it just means from the left. This little symbol right there means from the left. If you have a plus symbol up here, it means from the right. Right now, we don't use that terminology a whole bunch, but when you get to count one, you're going to use it a lot. Okay, especially that first chapter, you're going to see this from the left and from the right business again. Okay, but let's look at that. Here's where x is zero. If I'm looking at it from the left, doesn't the y value go down to negative infinity? Right? And if I look at what's happening to the right of zero, and I follow my graph getting closer and closer to zero, the y value is going to positive infinity, isn't it? So this is just their mathematical way of describing what's happening around that intercept. Okay. Now these are different. It's malicious, they're backwards. Now they're talking about the horizontal. Oh, what's this way? That's the way to graph the bottom of the page, right? So if you look at the horizontal, notice it says that as the y values go to zero, so as this y value, actually this one, as this y value, no, this, you have to go backwards. I don't know why they write. Oh man, I'm gonna try to be crazy. <laughs> look at the X first and then look at the Y. Okay, look at the X first and then look at the Y. 
So here, as x goes to negative infinity, that means I'm going that way, right? Isn't the y value going to get closer and closer and closer to zero? I just told you we'll never equal zero, right? And if x goes to positive infinity, it means it's going this way, the y value is also getting really, really, really close to zero. Okay, that's all that that is saying. Now, so that vertical line, that red line that I have like this, you can write the equation of this line. And it's always written as x equals the number. And it's the x value where this line is happening at. In this case, what is the x value in which this line is happening? To? It's at zero. So for here, my vertical asymptote is at x equals zero. Now, what about the horizontal asymptote? It's always going to be at y equals a number. And what y value is that happening at? It's happening at zero. Okay. So that's all this is telling you. It's just they make it look sound so complicated when you're reading these books, right? <laughs> it's just a little bit extra. Okay. There's another kind of asymptote, but we're not getting into that in this section just yet. We might be able to get into it in the next section if it happens at all. Okay. So looking at these two graphs, they're just trying to show you that sometimes you can have different scenarios. So for instance, on this graph, notice that the vertical asymptote is actually here, and it's at this value, x equal to negative one. And it has a horizontal asymptote, which is there, but it's at y equals two, right? Same thing here. This one actually doesn't have a vertical asymptote, does it? It's just a little bell curve. It doesn't have a vertical asymptote. But it does have, um, the thing does keep going closer and closer. So it does have a horizontal asymptote here on the x axis. And that y value is zero. So there's your, your equation for it. This one has both. It has the vertical asymptote here at x equal to one. And then you have a horizontal asymptote on the x axis again, which is that y equals zero. functions they're going to have this kind of behavior. You will learn more about hyperbola, hyper whatever. <laughs> you will learn more about those, a lot more about those in the account. Okay, there's like a whole chapter on it. For us, no. You're just like, oh, it's got that shape. That's it. Okay. How do we find these things, right? It's great if I give you the picture and you can see, oh, there's the vertical asymptote, so if x equals this, and there's the horizontal asymptote, it's y equals this, right? But what if all I give you is the, the function? All I give you is f of x equals the fraction. How do you find those vertical asymptotes and the horizontal asymptotes, okay? So here is the, the quick sheet of how to do it, okay? So for the vertical asymptote, notice what it says here. It says the function has vertical asymptotes at the zeros of the domain. So what does that mean? To find the vertical asymptotes, you're just going to take your denominator equal to zero. All right? We already do that when we do the domain, don't we? So there's nothing new there. Okay. However, um, the function can have one horizontal asymptote or it can have no horizontal asymptotes, okay? You just can't. Sometimes it will have them and sometimes it won't, okay? Here's how you can tell whether it will have one or none 
And if it does have one, what is it? Okay, this is the chart that we need. So you're going to look at, it says M and N. What are these numbers? This is the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator. So the highest exponent of the numerator and the highest exponent of the denominator is what you're looking at. If the highest exponent of the numerator is smaller than the bottom, an example here would be x squared over x cubed, right? The top exponent is smaller than the bottom exponent, right? If that's the case, you automatically have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, okay? Automatically. As long as the biggest exponent on the top is smaller than the biggest exponent on the bottom, it's automatically here. Nothing to do but just recognize, okay? However, if they have the same degree, like that, isn't the highest exponent on top three and the highest exponent on the bottom three? If they have the same exponents, top and bottom, the same degrees, then you have to take the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. So since this term is the term with the highest exponent, and this term is a term with the highest exponent, in this case, I would have a horizontal asymptote that y equals that guy's coefficient over that guy's coefficient. Okay, that's what this is so simple means. One with the top guy's leading coefficient over the bottom guy's leading coefficient. And then if your degree of the numerator is bigger than the bottom, you do not have horizontal asymptotes. You possibly could have another kind of asymptote or no, or none. Um, but I don't know that they go into that just yet. They do not, so I'm gonna leave them up. But in this case, an example would be if I had x to the third plus five over x minus two, right? The top exponent is higher than the bottom exponent. So I have no horizontal asymptotes, okay? I'll mention it, although we're not gonna go into it very far, but I'll mention it. The only other kind of asymptote you can have, we already have verticals and we already have horizontals, right? The only other one is a slanted one. What if there's a line like this that I don't cross? Maybe the graph goes like that, right? And it doesn't cross that imaginary slanted line. That's the other kind of asymptote you can possibly have. The only time that that happens is if the top exponent is bigger by exactly one. So notice I didn't do that on this example. I made this exponent bigger by how much? By two. But if I were to have had this over this, that will have a slant, a slant asymptote. And how do you find it? You do long division, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> but they're not going into that, so we're not gonna go into it, okay? But it does exist just in case for some weird reason you see one in calculus. I doubt it, but just in case. Okay, so here's our first example. It says for both of these, it wants you to find all the vertical and all the horizontal asymptotes. There's problems like this on the final exam, I saw it. So you will have this problem on the final exam where it just gives you the function and asks you for the vertical asymptotes. And then a whole other problem asks you for the horizontal asymptotes. So two points right there just for knowing the asymptotes, okay? So for A, if I want to find the vertical asymptotes, I will have to take my denominator equal to zero, right? And it's just a square, so I could um, try to extract the roots. There's a problem here, though. Can you take the square root of the negative number? What happens when you do? get the imaginary, don't you? And then the square root of one third, right? You can't graph imaginary stuff, can you? So then this means because of this I right here, 
that means there's no vertical asymptotes. Okay. I tried, but I can't graph imaginary stuff. Okay. So then now we look at the horizontal stuff. What is the degree of the numerator? The highest exponent of the top. That's the coefficient. The highest exponent of the top. What is this guy's exponent? One, it's a little imaginary one up there, right? So the highest exponent is one. What about for the denominator? What is the highest exponent on the denominator? Two, it's a square, right? So then which situation do I have? Do I have the numerator is less than the denominator? The numerator is equal? or the numerator is bigger. Which situation do I have? I have the less. And when you have that situation, it's automatically at y equals zero. Automatically, okay? So for A, it doesn't have any vertical asymptotes. It only has the horizontal asymptotes at zero, okay? Now for B, if I take B, I take that denominator equals zero, I can add the one over. And when I take the square root, I don't get imaginaries, do I? I get plus or minus one. So that means I have two vertical asymptotes, one at x equals one and one at x equals negative one. Okay. Now let's look at those degrees. What's the degree of the numerator? Looking at b, what's the degree of the numerator? Two, what's the degree of the denominator? The biggest exponent is two. So in this case, um, between the numerator being less, the numerator being equal, or the numerator being bigger, which one do I have? I have where they're equal. And then in that case, you're supposed to take the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. What is the leading coefficient of the numerator? Two is in front of that x squared, right? And what is the leading coefficient of the denominator? What number is in front of this x squared? One. And so that could just be written as y equals two. Okay. So you've got two vertical asymptotes and the horizontal on part B. Of course, they spend like five or six pages explaining that. So, so example three is a different one. So they do have some problems in here. Every single model or application problem that we have in this section, they're always going to give you the function, uh, or they're going to give you the graph. Okay, so they don't leave you guessing on these application problems. Like that other one with the cube when we had to come up with the equation and all that, these don't, they give them to you. Okay. So it says a utility company burns coal to generate electricity. The cost C in dollars of moving P percent of the smokestack pollutants is given by C equals to this function. And apparently P has to be a number between zero and hundred. It says sketch the graph of this function. You are a member of a state legislator considering a law that would require utility companies to remove 90% of the pollutants from their smokestack emissions. The current law requires 85% removal. How much additional cost would the utility company incur as a result of the new law? Now remember, P is the percent, right? So the percent is going to either be 85 or 90, right? So let's go look at what they're doing. Um, the first thing they want you to do is draw it. It says the graph of the function is shown in figure whatever. Note that. That's weird. It tells you to sketch it, but then they give you the graph. This is confusing. Normally, they won't tell you to sketch it if they give you the graph. So I don't know why this is there. All of our problems have the graphs on them. So I'm going to come down here. 
Although I'm going to write my equation because it disappeared. Okay, so there's my function there. And there's the image that they have. Okay. Oh, they have a function there, right? So they have this graph here, and then they notice that if you take the p value at 85%, if you plug it into this function, you apparently get some kind of value here. And then when you plug in 90, you get another y value, right? It wants to know what is the difference between those two y values. That's what the question is asking. Okay. So essentially, all we need to do is plug in the 85 and plug in the 90 into those two problems, into the function. So they plug in 85 for p into the function to get this value. They plug in 90 into the function and they keep that and they get this value. What is the difference between those two? You get this. Okay. And so then this is the response that they were looking for. Now, those word problems are not that complicated just because they give you everything. They already know they're about to torture you with the graphs later, so they can be easy on you for now. <laughs> okay, so here's one it says find all vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So, looking at that, how do I find the vertical asymptotes? What was the process to finding the vertical asymptotes? Mm -hmm. Denominator equal to zero. And then how do you get rid of that thing? Cube root, you got it. So we do cube root of this side and cube root of that side. Do not need plus or minus when it's a cube root. So I just get zero and I just get x minus eight. I get x equal to what? Property. This is the vertical asymptote right here. Okay. For the horizontal one, we have to think about the three cases. Okay. So what is the degree of the numerator? This one's tricky. Is there an x in the numerator? When there's no x, what is the exponent of x? If there's no x, zero. zero. And then what is the exponent? This one's also tricky. What is the exponent of the denominator? It's three. Because if I expanded this all out, don't I end up with x cubed? Right? So it's degree three. So in my situation, my numerator is less than my denominator, isn't it? And when it's less, it's automatically at y equals zero. Whenever the top is less, the top degree is smaller. Now, number two, same process for the vertical asymptote. We will take the denominator equal to zero. I'm going to minus the two over, and then I'm going to divide by that five. And so that's the vertical asymptote. Not too bad, right? What is the degree of the numerator here? It is one. What is the degree of the denominator here? This one, right? What is the degree of the denominator? Also another one, right? So in this case, my degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator. So we get the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. What is it though? It is negative seven and five. This is the term with the biggest exponent, right? So I have to take his coefficient, which is negative seven. This is the term with the biggest exponent. So I have to take his coefficient, which is positive five. Okay. They're just not in the right order, right? And then I don't think I can reduce that, so that's it. Y equals negative seven fifths is my horizontal asymptote. This one gets a little bit more complicated, but still not too bad. This one's got a trick to it, and I'll show you what it is before. So 
So for this one, if I find the verticals, I need to take that denominator and equal it to zero. This thing is not factorable, right? And if you can't factor it, how do you find the solution? So I'm gonna have to do quadratic. So negative B plus or minus B squared minus four A C all over two times A. But I do end up with an issue. I get negative 27. This is what? It's imaginary, okay? You cannot graph something that is imaginary. So this tells me there are no vertical asymptotes. So for the horizontal asymptotes, what is the degree of the numerator? Two. What is the degree of the denominator? Both highest exponents are two. So that means when they're the same, we take the leading coefficient of the top over the leading coefficient of the bottom. What is the leading coefficient of the top? Negative eight, good. And what is the leading coefficient of the bottom? Positive one, it's this guy, right? So we just get y equals negative eight for a horizontal axis but no vertical asymptotes. Now the last one asked me to graph it. I don't think I'm going to have enough time, so I might have to come back to that one, but we can do the asymptotes. Here's the trick though with this one. There's a negative in the front, right? We have not seen the negative in the front like that before. Okay, just take it and give it to the top so that it looks like this. And then just go ahead and distribute it. Right? So it's equivalent. It's the same thing, except now I don't have that funny negative in the front. So I can do all the same stuff we've been doing before. Okay. So for vertical asymptote, we take the denominator equal to zero and we get x equal to three. For our vertical asymptote, for our horizontal asymptote, we're going to take um, the degree of the numerator, which is what? It's just this exponent, right? Which is one. And the degree of the denominator, is this guy's exponent, which is one. And they're the same, aren't they? So we're gonna take the leading coefficient of the top over the leading coefficient of the bottom. What is the leading coefficient of the top? And what is the leading coefficient of the bottom? One. So we get y equal negative three for our horizontal asymptote. If they want you to graph it, we'll talk about this the next time because I'm not going to have time to do it. I'm just going to talk it out. You need some more information. You need to know the y-intercept. And you need to know the x-intercept. And then you need to have points. in each section created by your vertical asymptotes, okay? Which means you'll probably need to create a chart and then go from there. This is what I'm talking about. I'm not gonna draw this like for a real but I'm just gonna show you the sketch. If I have my vertical asymptote at three, that means there's an invisible vertical line here that I can't cross, right? And how many sections does a graph of that create? That creates two sections. One section on this left-hand side and one section on that right-hand side. If I find my y-intercept and my x-intercept, I will have a y-intercept, I will have a point on this side, right? So I'll be good there. If the x-intercept lives over here, I'm still good over there. But I wouldn't have anything over here, would I? So I would have to plug in a number, at least one, Usually you pick two, but you'd have to pick at least a couple of numbers in here so that you would know where the graph is at because you don't know anything about that side, okay? So we will do that the next time, and I think in the next section, that's all we're going to be doing is graphing.
Okay, so you will have a lot of part of that. We'll start for today. We are going to unfortunately have to have class tomorrow. It probably won't be as lengthy as it was today. Um, we need to finish 4.2 before we start doing the rest. Okay. Thank you. 